Welcome to this talk on the people and families of the Wandle Valley. My name is Mick Taylor and I am a volunteer at the Wandle Industrial Museum. The first family we will look at is the Watney family. This is a picture of the first Daniel Watney and he is said to have been found abandoned by gypsies on Wimbledon Common. It was his son John Watney and his grandson, also Daniel Watney, who were first linked with the Wandle Valley. <laughs> Most of us would associate the Watney family with the brewing industry, and I'm sure a number of you remain remember the Party 7 and the Watney's Red Barrel. Looking back, the Watney family were millers. Five generations of the Watney family were involved with mills on the River Wandle. John Watney was listed as a miller from Wimbledon, he took on the lease of Mitcham Mill in 1790, and this started the association of the Watney family with the Wandle. Several of the family were named Daniel. They had hands in mills at Croydon, Hackbridge, and several mills in Wandsworth. They moved into brewing when a younger John Watney started running a distillery on the Thames from 1850. This is James Watney, who was one of the last Watney family millers. It is he who formed a partnership with Henry Wells and went on to establish the Stag Brewery in Pimlico and started the Watney Brewing Company. Our next person to look at is Sir George Amaran. He was a wealthy merchant, banker, and a member of parliament who identified the potential in copper plate printing as invented by Francis Nixon. This is his coat of arms. The second son of Claudius Anian, who was surgeon in ordinary to King George II, his grandfather was a Huguenot who had left France in the late 1600s. George became the MP for Dunstable in 1754 and in 1760 was appointed as a director of the East India Company. In 1764, he became a baron. His vision as a businessman and his links with the East India Company no doubt contributed to the calico printing industry during the 1700s. There is a memorial to him, and that can be found in the All Saints Church in Carl Shorten. So let's move on. So, what have we got here? So why am I showing a picture of Brixton Windmill? The windmill was used by the Ashby family from 1817. As we know, a windmill needs wind. The problem was that the land surrounding the mill of Brixton was being redeveloped. New buildings restricted the amount of wind reaching the mill. As a result, the family decided in 1864 to move their business to the lower mill of Butterhill Carl Shorten. And then later, they moved to Grove Mill in Mitcham. They remained at Grove Mill until 1902, when they returned to Brixton and powered the windmill first with a steam engine and then by gas. The windmill finally ceased production in 1934, at which point it was closed and became derelict. It has since been restored and is now open to the public. Next family is Peter Morvillian and the Huguenots. In the late 17th century, King Louis XIV of France turned on the Protestants and the Huguenots as a result, around 200,000 Huguenots left France. Of these, 50,000 came to England. This influx brought about the word refugee into our language. It was these Huguenots who brought with them the skills and knowledge of textile printing. Having settled at first in the east end of London, they soon discovered the waters of the River Wandle. Peter Morvillian Sr. 
working with his brother Stephen, who was one of the most successful Huguenot refugees in the calico printing trade. And they established themselves in the Wandle Valley. By 1719, they were employing 205 people at the Ravensbury print works, shown here in the early 1900s. And Wandsworth. The methods they used were ahead of their time and the size of their premises and the diversity of their skills, of their workforce. They had aspects of factory working it would only be seen late in the 18th century as part of the Industrial Revolution. This is a picture of their tomb in St. Lawrence Church, Malden. They are said to have been buried upright. Next, we are going to look at the Reynolds family. These were a family of Quakers who owned one of the world's largest calico firms. Their roots could be traced back to Chichester in Sussex. In the mid 18th century, Thomas Reynolds was established in Southwark as a cloth maker. In 1751, he took out a lease for the Willows, Mitchum, calico printing works that had operated since 1720. In the 17th century, Thomas's son, Foster, came in to the business to manage the Willows at Mitcham, shown in this picture. They moved to Carl Shorten in 1779, when Foster then brought the 280-acre Culver's estate. He established breaching grounds on Culver's Island, which were referred to as the most extensive in the kingdom. This is the map of the Culvers in 1871. The bleaching fields were located in the southern part of the island. This is a drawing in their home, the Culvers. Foster had eight children, including two sons, William and Jacob, who carried on the Calico business. It was William's son, Charles, not a great businessman who had the last family links with Calico. The collapse of the Overend Gurney Bank in 1866 had a dramatic effect on the business. And this led to the sale and closure of the Calico works, including the great bleaching grounds. The state today is crossed from east to west by Culver's Avenue. Street names such as Reynolds Close, and Culver's Retreat also recalled a family and the extensive estate. With our next gentleman, you could get a bang. Joshua Dewey. In 1661, Hackbridge Mills were leased to Dewey, who was a powder maker. Dewey had previously made gunpowder at Chidworth near Guildford which is still a mill you can visit today. In 1651, he was recorded as having supplied the Admiralty with a total of 749 barrels. Unlike the former occupiers of the Hackbridge Mills, he was an outstanding, successful gunpowder maker. In an Admiralty investigation of 1655, his powder was found to be the best of those tested with a low failure rate. Drury went on to work at the gunpowder mills for the next 35 years. The Drury family also had links with other industries. John Drury, his son, was a brewer in Croydon. Gunpowder production on the Wandel finished in 1711, when John seems to have focused on his brewery business. One building Drury did own was Strawberry Lodge. Constructed in 1685, Strawberry Lodge is one of Carl Shorten's oldest buildings. Our next gentleman is someone I'm sure you will all recognise, Lord Nelson. This man does not really need an introduction. He's one of our national heroes. He lived near to the River Wandle and used to fish the river as well as to tend St Mary's Church in Merton Park. 
He also visited Mitchell to watch cricket on the cricket green. He lived in Merton with Lady Emma Hamilton up to his death at Trafalgar. Nelson paid £9,000 for an estate covering the ground between Quicks Road North, Morden Road West and Haydens Road, Abbey Road East in Merton, now better known as South Wimbledon. The house was known as Merton Place. Merton High Street divided the bottom southern half of that estate containing the house and gardens from the northern section with its subbery, an ornamental mound, often referred to as the Waterday Deck. Water from the Wandle supplied a moat which Lady Hamilton christened the Little Nile. This was spanned by an Italianate bridge and stocked with fish and boats. Nelson described the estate as Paradise Merton and seemed to have thoroughly enjoyed his time there. One of the families who occupied what we know now as Merton Abbey Wood Mills in Collier's Wood were the Littler family. Edmund Littler was from a large family of calico and silk printers. The Littlers already had works in West Ham and Morton Abbey by the time they arrived in Merton and took over the site. When he died in 1742, he left the business to his wife, Mary Ann, who carried on running the mills with her three sons, William, James, and Edmund. William took over when his mother retired in 1871, and Edmund, pictured here, was described as chemist to the works. His brother James had left the business by 1876, and Mary died in 1875, aged 75. William and Edmund continued in partnership until William's death in 1889. The younger Edmund Littler carried on alone, producing well-famous Paisley and art of uh, designs, which were sold by Liberties of London from 1875. This continued until the works were taken over by Liberty & Co in 1904. We're now going to look at the Starry family. And this is the old palace at Croydon, which was used as a bleaching and calico printing works by the family. They had taken over the old palace in 1796. It is possible that there were as many as three works on the site in the 1790s. Starry family continued on the site until around 1886. In 1889, the community of sisters opened a girls' school at the Old Palace. And it's still a school today. This next slide is from an excellent book by Lillian Thornhill, From Palace to Wash House, available from the Friends of Old Palace, Croydon. This shows the workers at the works and gives an idea of the trades involved. Note the line about some of the female apprentices and look at the ages of the girls who were employed. We're now going to move on to a man born in Dublin, Ireland, and that's William Kilburn. Kilburn was a leading calico printer and designer and the only son of Samuel Kilburn, an architect. He spent his leisure time drawing and designing patterns, which he sold to make pocket money so he could purchase a pony to visit his parents on a Sunday. After his father's death, he ended up in London, where he continued to sell his designs to calico printers. And it was through this work that he met a botanist called William Curtis. Their relationship produced a book called the Flora Londinius, which describes the flora found in the London region of the mid 18th century. With James Newton and James Morrison, Kilburn took over the Lisa Calico works in Wallington around 1780. But by 1812, Kilburn was by himself. 
after Kilburn became established at Wallington, it was said that he now rose rapidly in wealth and was soon the most eminent calico printer in England, having brought the art to a pitch of perfection never since equal. A few hundred of his originals of his watercolour designs make up the Kilburn album, which is housed at the Victorian Albert Museum in London. Kilburn did have some issues with his designs during his lifetime. In March 1787, he was a chief partitioner in requesting that Parliament grant design copyright protection to the textile industry. Ralph Yates, who was a London warehouseman, regularly sold Kilburn's designs to the firm of Pill & Co. in Bury in Lancashire who would copy the design and produce a cheaper fabric that appeared in shops within a few days. Something that is still a problem in the textile industry today. Now I'm going to move on to another William. This is William Morris. He was an English textile designer, poet, novelist, socialist activist, and in some might say a visionary thinker a leading character in the development of the arts and crafts movement. He made a major contribution to the revival of traditional British textile production methods during the last part of the 19th century. Morris began his association with Merton and the River Wandle when, in March 1881, he inspected George Welch works at Merton Abbey with his friend William de Morgan. The works have produced calico prints since the 1760s under a number of different owners. The wooden buildings and the area around them had an appeal to Morris. He retained the old buildings, renovating and adapting them as necessary. The firm flourished and Morris kept his connection with it until shortly before he passed away in October 1896. Morris and his company produced many fine prints based on the love of nature. The number of the patterns were designed by Morris himself. It wasn't just these that were produced at the Morris works that it became known. They also produced furniture, carpets, tapestries, and stained glass. Morris designs are still very popular today. Being a social reformer, Morris cared about his workers and the conditions they had to work in. He set aside gardens for the workers to enjoy on the site, had a dormitory for his apprentices on Merton High Street, and gave the workers better conditions in the workshops than could be enjoyed elsewhere. Sadly, the works no longer exist. The company closed down in August 1940, and they were then badly damaged during the Second World War, before the site was purchased by the new Merton Bald Mills, who demolished the buildings to make way for a new extension to their mills. A model of the works is at the museum, and it shows how it was at the time that Morris and Co. were in occupation. Well, let's move back now and let's look into brewing again. And this time we're going to look at Young's. The name of Young has been associated with brewing industry in Wandsworth since 1831, when Charles Allen Young and Anthony Bainbridge acquired the Ram Brewery. The brewery itself has been in existence since 1553. John Young was the fifth generation of his family in the business, and he was referred to as Mr. John. When he died, age 85, he was the oldest and longest serving chairman in the British brewing industry, having been at the helm of Young's and Wandsworth for more than four decades. In 2006, be shortly before his death, he made the decision to cease brewing at Wandsworth in order to realize the huge development value of the five and a half acre brewery site and to move the brewing operation into a new joint venture with Charles Welsh, Bedford Brewers. His death came in the week when beer was being brewed at Wandsworth for the last time. But 
that isn't quite the end. Today, a microbrewery, similar to many that now exist, is located in the old stable block, looked after by John Hatch, a former employee of Young's. And Sly Beast Brewery have taken over the Ram Inn that was part of the brewing site. The last person we're going to speak about is Gillette Hatfield Jr. The Hatfield family lived at the Malden Hall Park estate for over a hundred years. Gillette Hatfield and his son, Gillette Edward Hatfield, in the centre of this picture, can be credited with making the park what it is today. Malden Cottage is a weather-boarded villa situated in the Rose Garden in Malden Hall Park. The Hatfield family lived here at first before buying Malden Hall. Following the outbreak of the Great War, Gillette Edward Hatfield, the last owner, gave instructions that Malden Hall should be converted to a military hospital. The last Hatfield, being a bachelor, moved back to the cottage in 1906. He bequeathed the Malden Hall estate to the National Trust in 1941. There were two snuff mills on the site, each having its own water mill. Both mills were leased to James Taddy and Co. One of the company direction, directors was Alexander Hatfield, a tobacco merchant and snuff manufacturer in 1845. Along with the build, buildings at Merton Abbey Mills, this is one of the best examples of a mill site along the Wandle. The mill shut in the 1920s following a strike by the workers. The workers at Morden Hall, who were better paid and looked after than other mill workers, went out in support of colleagues in London. As a result, the decision was taken to shut down the mills. That concludes this talk. Thank you for listening. And should you have any questions, then please email the museum. Thank you for listening.